The grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning, everyone. The unknown writer of the letter to the Hebrews encourages Christians not to give up meeting together for fellowship, for worship, for teaching. So it's good to see you on this Lord's Day as we seek the presence of our God and seek to understand more of his ways with us. If you're a visitor with us this morning, we extend a special welcome. And although I won't be with you after the service, I hope that there will be time for further fellowship there over tea and coffee. But let's now worship God together as we sing, Jesus is King and I will extol him. Friends, the psalmist will lead us into prayer with these words. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. The Lord is near to those who are discouraged. He saves those who have lost all hope. Let us pray. Almighty God, it is our highest privilege to be aware of your presence with us this morning and our hearts are filled with gladness that we can rely on your presence in all the setbacks and all the disappointments of life your peace can loosen the bonds of fear and anxiety your love can purify our lives of resentment and bad feeling your life brings us off our knees and makes us strong to face the tests and the challenges through which we all must pass. And so we give thanks that you have never left us without a helper. And we praise you that your spirit is equal to every circumstance in life. 
Lord Jesus, it is a thrilling prospect to envisage you present with us in this moment. But it is also a rebuke to us because we know that we failed to measure up to the pattern of your life. We are choosy about the people we love. We give help to those who will help us. We find time to do things which glorify ourselves and we neglect the times of prayer, Bible reading and service which glorify you. So we come to you with a sense of having fallen short but with the great promise you have given us that we can be forgiven, that we can set aside the things of the past and look forward to a better future, closer to you and more firmly set in your ways. We pray all of this in your name and ask that you would hear us now as together we say the prayer you have taught us to say. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> well, good morning, boys and girls. Nice to see you. Tell me this. <coughs> Any of you ever moved house? A couple of nods, you know, but uh, I just wonder because um, we're getting ready to to move house just now and I suppose if you have had that experience then you know there's some things that don't move with you. If you had that experience having to leave things and maybe you wanted to take them but your mum and dad said you're not taking that. I've heard that a couple of times. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of times. Well, it's amazing though, when you're digging through your, your stuff, you know, all the things that you've gathered over the, the years, and you come across things that you've forgotten that you had. You know, that can, that can happen. And I discovered that I had tons and tons and tons of things like this. Do you know what that is? You probably think it's from Jurassic Park. But at one time, this was reckoned to be one of the greatest inventions in the history of, of humankind, was the audio cassette. I don't suppose you've got any of those, have you? Well, I've got to, uh, well, I am talking to the children. <laughs> you don't have, well, I, I just didn't realize how many of these, uh, this is actually Sir Cliff, that shows you how old. Shows you how old it is, actually. Um, anyway, um, so I wondered, what do, why do we, what do we do? I don't want to throw them away. You know, um, it would be nice to think they would do some good. Anyway, I had a brainwave. And there is a charity shop that deals with music. And I phoned up the lady and asked, kind of not really expecting to get a good response. Was she interested in audio tape? Oh, yes, she said. They're very popular these days. I think it must be historians <laughs> who are going to the chat. But it's nice to think that, uh, that you're giving something away and that it's going to do some good. The other thing which, um, <laughs> which I discovered that I had tons of were well, these, these things. Now, this is a step up. This is Bruce Springsteen, the boss. And I've got dozens and dozens of, of those. Now, the thing is, 
they are actually becoming more popular, aren't they? What a nods here. And I had a phone call from London, not from Bruce Springsteen. He's, he's in Chicago, I think. But uh, no, I had a phone call from London, from our Mark. He's my, my oldest son. And, you know, I'm told, um, basically, you know, things, things have to be, to, to be put, uh, thrown away or put aside. But he's telling me to hold on to my vinyl until he's had a look at it. <laughs> until he's had a look at it because there might be some, some uh, <coughs> vinyl music that's, uh, that's interesting to, to him. So, so there we are. It, it's quite... Um, it's good to think that if we, oh, I don't know about Mark, mind you, but it's good to think that if, you, if we're giving things away, they're doing some good. Now, what everybody's wanting to know is, what are you doing with your books? Now, this is a big, this is a big challenge. But I discovered that a friend of mine was involved with an organisation called BookAid, right? Now, BookAid was set up to take books out to various countries in Africa. Now, the books have to be about Jesus. And some of them go to colleges, and some of them even to university libraries, if they're, if they're appropriate. And they help people to prepare for work as ministers or missionaries, that kind of thing. And all you do is you put all your, your books into a box, you take them to my friend, and he makes sure that they go to, to book aid. So, that's another example of how you, know, you have to give things away, and it may be quite hard to, to give some things away, but it's great to think that they're doing some good. And it's a reminder to, to me that part of being a follower of Jesus is that we are giving people, that we are prepared to, to give. Jesus himself used to, to give so much time and energy to, to other people, and he encouraged others to be the same. Do you remember the, the story that he once told? about a man who was attacked and he was robbed and he was left at the side of the Jerusalem to Jericho road. Some people are nodding, that's good. Jesus told that story and the poor man was lying there and folk just passed him by. They didn't do anything to help him until one man came along and he was willing to give his time to the man who was injured. He even bandaged up his wounds to make him feel a bit better. He was willing to give him his donkey because he, had a, he was traveling on a donkey and he put the injured man on the donkey. And he was willing to pay for a night or even two, or even three nights in a hotel until he was better. That was, the, that was the kind of man that he was. He was a giving man. And Jesus said we should all be like that. We should all be prepared to give so that the world will be a better and a more loving place. And, you know, there's sometimes when you, you think that the world is a very dark place because of all the the bad things that are happening. What Jesus is teaching us is that we can lighten things up, we can light things up if we give, if we show our love for other people who are in any kind of need. And we're going to sing now about that. We're going to sing about walking in the light of God so that people in the world can see things in a better way. Let's sing it together.
Friends, our scripture reading this morning will be from the book of Jeremiah, not a message of, of farewell from the prophet, but one that I feel would be good for us to focus on. And uh, Brian Adair, one of our elders, will read to us from the book of Jeremiah. But before we, we do that, let's pause for our prayer for understanding. We'll remain seated and sing, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. The reading this morning comes from the Old Testament, uh, and it's Jeremiah, chapter 29, and I'm reading from the first verse through to verse 23. Listen to and hear the word of the Lord. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the Queen Mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the artisans, had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elasa, son of Shaphan, and to Jeremiah, son of Haikai, whom Jeroboam, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. He said, This is what the Lord Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. You may say, the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon, but this is what the Lord says about the king who sits on David's throne and all the people who remain in this city, your countrymen who did not go with you into exile. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I will send the sword, famine and plague against them, and I will make them like poor figs, that are so bad they cannot be eaten. 
I will pursue them with the sword, famine and plague and will make them abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth and an object of cursing and horror, of scorn and reproach among all the nations where I drive them. For they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord, words that I sent to them again and again by my servants, the prophets. And you exiles have not listened either, declares the Lord. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, or you exiles, whom I have sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, said about Ahab, son of Kolai and Jerichai, son of Masai, who are prophesying lies to you in my name. I will hand them over to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will put them to death before your very eyes. Because of them, all the exiles from Judah who are in Babylon will use this curse. The Lord treat you like Zedekai and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon burned in the fire. For they have done outrageous things in Israel. They have committed adultery with their neighbours' wives, and in my name have spoken lies, which I did not tell them to do. I know it, and am a witness to it, declares the Lord. Amen, and may God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. We will now continue to worship God by singing, Fairest Lord Jesus, Ruler of all nature. let us pray. God our Father, we ask that the experience of being together under your word on this Lord's Day would enable us to see Jesus more clearly in all his fairness, 
in the depth of those things he has done that in the end we may be like him. We ask that your spirit would speak to us in the depths and give us the will to aspire to that life which he cherishes for each one. And we pray this in his name. Amen. It's a tradition in the Church of Scotland, folks, that on the first Sunday after a a minister has been inducted to a new charge, he is preached in, usually by a colleague and friend. And it's always a great privilege to be asked to, to do that. I've been asked to do that a few times for friends. But I don't know if uh, any of you can remember that first Sunday in my ministry some time ago now, but it was my friend and colleague David Grant who preached me and David who in many ways had a great influence in the way that my ministry took shape in the early days. He, in his preaching, he made a comparison between a time of vacancy in a church's life and exile. Uh, Maybe not the kind of exile that you would read about in the pages of history, calamitous experiences, but if we take exile to be a time when a people are in a place where they don't want to be, then I think that the comparison holds. A vacancy for a congregation is a time of uncertainty. It's a time when they're unsettled in various ways. And there is great need for them to be wholeheartedly turned to the sources of God's truth and his love and his inspiration. What matters, of course, at any time of of exile, any time of unsettlement and uncertainty, what matters is how people respond to that. And that is where we can learn something from the people of Judah, Judah being the southern kingdom of Israel in the 6th century BC. We have something to to learn from these ancient people and how they responded to the experience of exile, being in a place where they didn't want to be. Or at least we will learn this morning how they were called to respond to that time of uncertainty and unsettlement. Just briefly, as you probably will remember, the kingdom of Judah has been overrun by Babylon, one of the great superpowers of the ancient Near East. Jerusalem has been laid waste. The temple was in ruins. And the most influential people in the nation had been rounded up and taken away to the land of Babylon. There were people left in Jerusalem, but the real movers and shakers were taken away into exile. So we're talking about a a conquered people. We're talking about a a people who've been taken away from everything that's familiar to them into a strange land, 700 miles away approximately, where the language was different, where people worshipped idols, where the culture was alien, and even the physical geography of, of the place was so different. It was flat and barren and featureless, very different from the the hills of home. 
So there they are, they're transplanted into this place. And the challenge is, how are we going to live from this day forward? What are our prospects? How are we going to respond to this dark and difficult experience? Well, they weren't without spiritual resources. They had prophets who were with them. And we heard um, in Brian's reading how God felt about these prophets, and we'll get back to that uh, later on in, in the preaching. But the messages that these people were coming out with, and, and they were claiming to be messengers from God, but the, message, the messages just seemed to contradict one another. Some of the prophets were saying, well, you know, it's only going to be a short time. We'll only be here in Babylon for a couple of years, you know, so let's just hunker down, stay in the fringes of Babylonian life and things will all work out okay. Others were a bit more aggressive. They said, we can't stand being in this place and probably the way forward is to make life as difficult as possible for the Babylonians. Let's put up our own resistance to what has happened to us. Well, Jeremiah, he has been left in Judah, interestingly enough. He's just regarded as a pest, a nuisance. They don't want to take him to Babylon. He said, no influence at all on the people of, of Judah. But he gets word of, of what's happening in the exile and we don't know the details but he manages to, to sneak this letter into a batch of letters, official letters that are being taken to Nebuchadnezzar but which are going to be heard, going to be read to and heard by the exiles in Babylon. And you can imagine that this letter was going to be very unwelcome to the people in exile. Very unwelcome indeed. It would be a difficult message for them all to hear because what Jeremiah is saying, and he was probably one of the most unpopular of all the, the prophets because he said it as he received it from God. And sometimes the message was very challenging. What he tells the people in exile is that they're going to be, they're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. They're going to be there for a very long time. And what's important is how they will respond to this. What's important is how well they make the best of this experience. Because fundamentally this is an opportunity for you, says Jeremiah. It's an opportunity for you to fall back on the eternal things. To cultivate your relationship with your God and to commit yourself more firmly to the ways that he has revealed to you. If you put it all together in the letter, what Jeremiah is saying to his people is, it's going to be a long haul. And what matters is that you are the people of God during these years. What matters is that you make a positive contribution to Babylonian society to show yourself to be the people of God. I can't help thinking about the, the 
parable that Jesus told about the, the yeast in the dough. Do you remember it? You know, he pictures a woman making bread, and it would be a woman in those days before somebody jumps on me. Um, dig a hole, eh? <laughs> he pictures this person making bread, right? And, and there's a big batch of, of dough. And just a small amount of yeast is put in the dough, but it spreads through the dough, it permeates the dough and provides bread to feed the hungry. And Jesus says the kingdom of God is like that. The people of God are like that. They may be small, they may be weak, they may be without resources, but they can have an impact. And it begins at home, according to, to Jeremiah. It begins at home in this challenge to be the, the people of God. He says, you know, you're going to have to settle down, folks. Plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Now I'm sure that the people of Judah, as they're coming to terms with their exile, they're looking around and they're thinking that these Babylonians are weird. They worship idols. Their customs are strange. They have different values from us, the people of God. But you can bet your bottom dollar that the Babylonians are thinking the same about the, 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 the Israelites. I mean, they're thinking that these, you know, what have we done bringing these weird folk into our society? There was going to be that distance between the two communities. But Jeremiah is calling upon his people to look around them and to see that the Babylonians were not that much different from themselves. They were homemakers. They were providers for their families. They were concerned about those who were, were closest to them in so many different ways. And Jeremiah is calling upon God's people to be like them, to live these ordinary lives and be the people of God in the circumstances that have been presented to them. There's no area of life where we stop looking to God for our inspiration and our strength and our values. Some years ago there was a, a book, and I, I think it won the, the, the Booker Prize, but I'm not absolutely sure. It was called The God of Small Things. The God of Small Things. And this is, this is our God. There is no aspect of our lives, friends, where we are not called to be his people. And we know this because of Jesus. Jesus who was part of a family. Jesus who worked for a living. Jesus who made relationships with people round about him. He, he was, before he declared himself, before his ministry began, people knew him in Nazareth. He shows us that there is no aspect of our daily lives where God is not present and where we are called to be God's people. That story that we were reminded of, one of the, 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 the most famous of, of, of all Jesus' stories, the, the Good Samaritan. Yeah, he's just going down the Jerusalem to Jericho Road with no thought of any significant encounter 
And yet there's an opportunity there to show love, care, kindness. It's the same for us in our calling to be God's people, to be a to make ourselves known, to, to enable an impact to be made for the glory of Jesus' name in the lives that, that we live. Like the yeast in the, in the door, the, the small thing that is recognized in the eternal world as being a step forward in the advancement of the kingdom. But of course, it's not just in the small things, because no community can ever, can ever be unaware of the fact that they're part of a, a wider society. And Jeremiah has taken this on board. In verse 7 of our passage, Jeremiah says, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have, I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now, that would come as a great shock to the people of God in Babylon at this time. You know, you think of what the Babylonians have done to them. They've conquered them. They've destroyed Jerusalem. Goodness, they've, they've destroyed the, the temple, the focal point of our worship and, and devotion. They worship idols, these people. Their morality is, personal morality is decidedly dodgy. And here comes Jeremiah telling us to pray for their, for their peace and for their prosperity. And the time was, was going to come, of course, if you're familiar with the book of Daniel, when there was active persecution of the, the, the people of God. And this is ringing in their heads. Jeremiah's telling us to pray for their peace and their prosperity. But it's going to be a long time, folks. It's going to be 70 years that you've been in exile and you must make a positive contribution to the society of which you're a part. What, what you think, what is the alternative? The alternative is to go in the huff and kind of just go into a fetal position on the, on the margins of society and let the world go by, or you can allow yourself to be consumed in your inner being by the darkness of resentment and hatred for these people who have conquered the land that you loved. And that does you no good, as well as anyone else but this is what Jeremiah is asking them to, to, to set aside don't be chewed up in your inner being by negative thoughts by unworthy aspirations pray for, for Babylon for its peace and its prosperity and this is something that we need to take on board, friends, because there may be decisions that are taken in relation to us as a congregation in the months that lie ahead. And it's not that it will be inappropriate for us to question those decisions vociferously. But what is not on is to allow ourselves to become so chewed up in our inner being that there's a blockage. We're less than open to others 
less than open to a positive outcome of a time of, of difficulty. You know, I was reading just yesterday about the experience of one man who spent some time in a religious community in, in Canada and he was immediately struck. It was a Jesuit uh, community and he was touched by the, the kindness, by the, the quietness, by the stillness of the people around them. That was until one evening they got down to discussing politics. And he said he was just so taken aback that those lovely, kind, sweet, was the word he used, people were capable of such basic hatred of other people in their position. This is not what Jeremiah wants for, for God's people. It's not what we need in this moment, friends. What I've always thought on a personal level is that, you know, whenever I come out with something negative about a person or a policy or whatever, am I just, am I just as passionate and praying for that person? Am I just as passionate about providing an alternative to what I see as wrong and being willing to work out that alternative? This, I think, is what Jeremiah is, is asking for in his people. Like the yeast in the dough. You're a small group within Babylon. He wouldn't ask them to pray for the peace and prosperity of, of the, the land if they were not capable of, of helping that along. So here you are, a small group of people, the yeast in the dough. Are you willing to make an impact for the best? Are you willing to link up with, with God's project to establish his justice, his love, his truth throughout the world? And all of this, you know, being a witness, being the yeast in the the dough beginning at home, spreading out into society. It all depends on what is shaping us and what is taking us forward. Jeremiah is in no doubt that this is the word of God. Verse 8, he says, this is what the Lord, the God Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They're prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Another shock. People who are setting themselves up as prophets, as bringing messages from the throne room of the eternal God. And Jeremiah is bringing a message from God saying, he has not sent them. These confusing messages from people who set themselves up as a mouthpiece from God. Some of them saying, two years and we'll be back in Jerusalem. Others saying, it's time. We flexed our muscles and showed these Babylonians, what we are made of. Jeremiah said, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Now this is getting into an area that could upset a lot of people. But if we're taking our lead from Scripture, there's absolutely no doubt 
that there is a phenomenon which started in Israel and which was present in the early church. There is the phenomenon of false teaching. Teaching about God, teaching about the values that have God's authority behind them. And it's possible that from within the community of the church, you're hearing false teaching. Sum it up by saying, not all God talk is true. And it's been a problem right from the beginning. But against that, and that's all I'm going to say, but against that, we have this call of our Lord Jesus himself to know the truth. The truth that will set us free. And what is demanded of us is that we create a default position within ourselves. We so shape our inner being that we are looking to God and the word that he has provided for us to take us forward in the life of faith. It is good for us and we all need it. It's good for us to pause at times and ask where our vision of God is coming from, where our values are coming from. We need to be looking to our God entirely. So Jeremiah is, is calling on God's people in this moment of crisis in their lives. He's calling on them to be the people of God and to make an impact at every level of their lives. In a sense, it's not what people want to hear, but it comes with a promise. Verse 11 where he says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And we need to hold that in our hearts in this moment, folks. That God has his plans for his people. And these plans are good and these plans are, are loving. But the challenge for us is, will we have the will to turn to him and to trust him in this moment? Now, it's a huge thing to, to, to address the whole issue of why bad things happen to good people, why difficult circumstances come upon the church. Is God the, the, the source of, of this? Is it part of the will of God that we should go through difficult days at a personal level and at the level of a community? Another big issue. What I am convinced of is that when pressure is placed on an individual or on a community by circumstances, that is an opportunity for faith to grow. That can be shown in scripture, it can be shown in the experience of, of God's people down through the millennia. It's an opportunity for us to get closer to God. 
It's an opportunity for us to, to appreciate more of what he is doing for us as a people. And fundamentally what Jeremiah is saying to the community of Judah in exile is, this is your opportunity. This is your opportunity to build yourself up in faith, to renew the vision of what God is seeking to do towards you. It's the opportunity for a new beginning. Forget about going back to Jerusalem as it was. Think of what it was like, says Jeremiah. The unfaithfulness, the immorality. You want to go back to that? God has something better planned for you. He is planning the new Jerusalem. But you have to make this choice. Is this what you want? Says the prophet. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Says God. Is this where you are? Is this what it means for you to be part of God's people? Constantly seeking him. And the, with the prospect of finding, finding him an enriched experience of, of, of your relationship with him and a deeper conviction in his ways with us. And what this means for us in the future, folks, is, is a return to a deeper appreciation of the means of grace. You know, I, um, it's great to think that we have four young adults joining the church very soon. And I remember when I was going through the process and the means of grace were, were emphasized to us. The means whereby God becomes real to us, speaks to us, takes us forward. The means of grace are quite simply prayer, worship, God's word. Whatever happens, this is the way forward for us to have a deeper appreciation of the way that God makes himself known to us and takes us forward in his hope. Let me just finish with a verse, again from Jeremiah, earlier on in his book, when he calls upon the people of Judah to stand at the crossroads and look, ask for the ancient paths, for the things that have always been a help, a comfort and a strength to God's people. Worship, prayer, the word. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. Let's pray. <coughs> God our Father, we ask <coughs> we ask that you will Father, entrench us in the ancient ways to make us a people who are turned towards you, ready to receive the comfort, the strength, and the peace that only you can give. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together, O breath of life, come sweeping through us.
let us pray. God our Father, we give thanks that we are amongst the people in the world who can give out of our surplus. And we pray that as we have given our gifts of money today in whatever shape or form, that we can ask you to regard this as symbolic of the whole of our lives given to you, our time, our talents, everything that makes us strong in life. We pray that it would be to the benefit of others. And we think, Lord, of the church in this moment and ask that those who are in positions of uncertainty, positions of unsettlement, that they would know the presence of your Holy Spirit in this moment, particularly if they're under pressure even to, to gather for worship in the Lord's day for fear of persecution. Lord, we ask that you would draw near to all our brothers and sisters restricted in this way and give them your peace. We, thank, we think also of the world at this time. We hear news of disaster in Pakistan. We know the war continues in Ukraine. There are so many other trouble spots in the world where it might be difficult to talk of hope. But we ask, O oh Lord, that all of this would diminish, this darkness would be pushed back in the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray also for our own land in this time. We remember that so many people are under pressure because of the economic circumstances that we all face at this time but others, some more than, than others. And we pray, Lord, that those who look forward into the, the future with dread and despair would be given the hope and the resources that they need to go forward in faith. And we pray, Lord, for people we know who are feeling the pressure more than most because their health has broken down because they're facing the challenge of bereavement, because their prospects as they look into the future with regard to their work are not good. Lord, draw near. We pray that the pressures of this time would turn people's minds and hearts towards you for the solid hope and lasting treasure that none but Zion's children know. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Sing together, friends, Lord, in love and perfect wisdom.
God of hope fill you with all joy and peace because you trust in him. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore.